come back to hybrid futures and the Digital Day 2021. I'm Katharina Haig and I'm guiding you through the conference today. This day, this conference is brought to you by the House of Innovation, which is a part of the Stockholm School of Economics, together with the Wallenberg Foundations and Digital Idag. We will now continue to explore the human aspect of digital transformation. And I'm proud to introduce our third keynote speaker for the day, Amy Edmondson, Professor of Leadership and Management at the Harvard Business School. She will talk about how psychological safety is an absolute prerequisite for creativity. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Amy. You are staying with us. Um, and I'd also like to say that Makoto Fujimura is also still online with us for now. We will continue to explore creativity, but in a slightly new context. Um, we have talked a lot about the House of Innovation. It is home to an exciting research center for leadership and design named The Garden. And one of the curators of this center is Professor Roberto Verganti, who will actually moderate this ensuing conversation. Roberto, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks for joining this session. It's a session on uh, uh, digitalization, especially hybridization in the space of creativity. Uh, and this is a very uh, interesting space because what is the most unlikely activity or session that we will do digitally and remotely? Probably a creative session, uh, especially we're talking here as special kind of creativity. There is a type of creativity that we can already do fully digitally. Actually, this happening already, classically problem solving. You have a problem and you solve it, you find a solution. Actually, nowadays, increasingly, these activities are developed by artificial intelligence. But there is another kind of creativity, which is uh, more imaginative, is how we make sense of a changing world how we develop and imagine new strategy, and especially when we want to do this in a collective space, together with others. That's much more difficult to move in a digital space. And yet, it happened. It happened a year and a half ago. Suddenly, we had to do it. We couldn't stop creativity, of course. So many organizations have moved digitally. But now there is a new challenge to move creative activity in a hybrid space, which means a little bit digital and a little bit physical, which makes some of the sides that we have been talking about earlier, for example, psychological safety, when someone is there, someone is far. What are the implications of hybridization for creative activities? Well, we will discuss uh, about this with uh, in a panel with four uh, contributors. Uh, one is uh, Makoto Fujimura. You met him before. Artists uh, will talk a lot about creativity and 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 hybridization. Amy Edmondson, uh, with a focus patient in hybrid spaces, and uh, Lisa Lindström. Hope I pronounce your family name correctly, who is the CEO of EY Doberman and is uh, a linear organization in the space of design, so quintessential creativity. And then with the fourth panelist that I want to uh, engage directly. So the question is for you, uh, how to rethink creative activities in a hybrid world? Thank you, Roberto, and, and thank you for inviting me in this very inspiring panel. Uh, I'm Roberto Verganti, talking to you to from your same space, but from some undefined point in time. Could be yesterday, could be tomorrow, and and you ask about how you know people can rethink their creative activities thanks to digitalization, hybridization. And one way, classic, is to say that hybridization can remove this limitation of space. You can connect with people remotely and access talents, whatever it is. But there is another way of looking at the power of digitalization and hybridization. It is the removal of the limitation of time. Uh, 
you can record material and, and use it later into a creative activities or come back in time and, and reinterpret a, a creative session that you did before. Uh, so I think that this idea of redefining models of time and the meaning of time is an extremely powerful way to use the potential of hybridization, especially in this moment in which time is the new goal and new time models are a way to create new business models. Uh, thank you, Roberto. Uh, very interesting insight. So it's not only about space, it's also about time. And, and I will, in this case, I will try to engage uh, Makoto, uh, because Makoto, uh, we're talking about before the connection between, you know, time and reflection and art, and, and it's, it's, it's working on slow art, but also in, in, in fast art and, and making this finger stream. So Makoto, what is your understanding of how our concept of time is changing because of this movement of creativity in hybrid spaces? Yeah, thank you. It, it occurs to me that um, that is precisely what the new opportunities are in, uh, in thinking about generative. Um, is is that you know poets have always recognized uh, that the words have power. So T.S. Eliot speaking, you know, begins his four quartets, uh, his, his his great novel, uh, great po poem, final poem that he wrote, uh, you know, uh, time present and time past, right? Uh, so, so the, the time element, as, as you note, and what I do as an artist is to slow time down here in my studio, but in a sense, I recognize that the um, reality of hybrid um, um, world and uh, digitization has actually empowered artists to speed up the process of communication and transmission and even the market. Place. Uh, today, you know, you can kind of skip the traditional gallery model by posting your images on Instagram, and, and many artists are finding uh, quite a bit of sustainability. And, and also with blockchain uh, technology, with NFTs uh, coming, play, becoming a game changer, I, I think, in, in terms of um, many ways that artists can market uh, his or her work or music. But at the same time, it compresses time. So the challenge is how to find that uh, zone in the um, technology to stretch time. And what you just did uh, is, 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 a, is one way to do it, is, is, is to create a, a, um, a dissonance or disruption in, in, by, by intentionally introducing something that was recorded in the past, but, but is not alive until the present moment. Um, so in a sense, you're able to confuse at least and, and uh, create a imaginary uh, way that we can be even talking to ourselves, <laughs> you know, present and past. Um, but I guess the ultimate question that we can think about is um, how do we create the future, right? The, how do we uh, create a kind of community and organization that, that can begin to speak into the future and, and therefore uh, creating something new. And I, I, it occurs to me that psychological safety is certainly one of the critical elements that we have to have. And, and the trust that we have in, in, in technology is, is, you know, is, is tenuous. So how do we bridge that? by creating a commun communal physical reality on top of what we, we might call hybrid uh, reality. I, I think those, those are questions that um, we, we have to answer. Uh, thank you, Makoto. Uh, this connects to what uh, Amy was saying before about psychological safety. And, and what is interesting with hybridization, which is diff different than moving fully digital, is, is not only the trust on the technology, but the unbalance of the communication. I mean, having someone close physically and someone connected remotely or someone connected from the past and from the future create this quite strong imbalance in, in, in the environment. So, I mean, did you study it or do you any, any way had any research or implication of what does it mean to have unbalanced means of creating uh, safety in, uh, in a team? You know, it, early on, you know, a year ago or over a year ago, 
even a year and a half ago, um, we were I was studying fully remote teams, teams that had always been face to face, but now were fully remote. And uh, and an obvious finding is that they felt um, it, 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 less psychological safety in the sense of it is harder to speak up right the threshold the threshold for believing that what i'm about to offer might be accepted went up right it went sort of naturally went up because it's a little harder to get in we actually aren't seeing body language very well we're not making eye contact when we have the fake experience of eye contact it's because like right now i'm looking at the green dot not at at, uh, at you um, so, so the challenge increased, and the 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 thing we were experimenting with is you figure out how to use the digital tools to supplement that loss, right? To through um, through polls or hand raises or um, 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 you know explicit breakouts to to get people talking and 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 all of that using the digital tools. But now I think we can only hypothesize the impact of, of digital um, hybrid of, of hybrid environments where some are some are face to face and some are remote. Um, and because I don't think we've been doing it long enough to have good data, um, but the hypothesis is one you already uh, alluded to, which I think is very likely to be supported, which is that we get an in group out group effect. It is. Um, it is a thousand percent easier to sort of connect with someone who's here compared to someone whom I either have to set up a Zoom meeting or pick up the phone, which nobody does anymore, uh, and reach out. That's just, you know, that now we have uh, one group with the threshold here and the other group with the threshold here. We are going to naturally gravitate uh, to connect more and feel more connected to and feel more psychologically safe with those who are proximal. Good. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, and uh, and here we come to the point you anticipated. You know, we we can only guess what we will be because in reality we have been operating digitally, but hybridization is the frontier. And and that's the idea of having you, Lisa, here. So, how are you experimenting, or what are you planning to address this world in which you will have part of your teams here, part of your team remote? What's happening in uh, in AI Dober Doberman? So first of all, I think that, you know, it started by, you know, us feeling a little bit clunky and a little bit, you know, not used to having the body language as one of the strongest tools maybe to create safety in a room. Uh, but that is a pretty good wake up call, a pretty good um, way for us to look into what could this be. So the way that we are experimenting is how can you feel a sense of belonging when it's unbalanced to your point? How can we work in these different dimensions? And I actually right now think that what we are exploring is other capabilities of creativity that we did not have before. So I actually think that all our tools in creativity has been focusing on extroverts, have been focusing on verbal skills, have been focusing on, on kind of what Amy just referred to as feeling that you're allowed to speak out. But what are the other things that we do not see? So, you know, when you were talking about the different dimensions of time, so now we have whiteboards uh, where we can leave traces over time. That's interesting. How can we connect? One of the things that we've been exploring is that we have a Doberman perfume so that we will all f you know, smell the same. And then you know, just experimenting with different senses to see if that creates a sense of belonging. So yes, there is now <laughs> a Doberman perfume. I don't know if it will work, but you know, uh, let's see that. And, and I think it's something around this uh, trust and, and creativity that sits within. So I think that we will work a lot more of making sure that people feel free, feel allowed within themselves, because the demands are actually more on you when we don't have the groups all aligned in the same room. Fantastic. I, I'm really intrigued by the Dover and fragrance. We connected to what Makoto was saying at the beginning, that you you become and you belong first with your senses and then you develop language. So that's very intriguing. Uh, before we move to the second round of questions, uh, just a note for those who are connected remotely, you can ask questions uh, in the in the chat and, and, and then I can see them through some special 
digital hybrid effect uh, and reported to the speaker. But <laughs> as I read your questions, uh, just a, a, a very simple, quick uh, round, a little more personal uh, about something that you personally in your experience uh, in the last few months uh, I've, I've found curious it's something that was surprising you in the way of working more remotely or uh, or, s or digitally uh, i will start again with makoto something you know a, an, an anecdote of your personal experience because we often talk about someone else but what happened to you something you want to report Yes, um, and I released a book uh, early uh, this year called Out of Yale, Yale Press, uh, Art, Art Plus Faith, The Theology of Making. So uh, unfortunately, I couldn't go on the book tour or, you know, lectures. Uh, so I did a lot of uh, uh, interviews, podcast interviews, and uh, obviously Zoom lectures. And I began to think of it um, as an opportunity to connect with individuals because we're all in our Zoom rooms, right? And let's say there's 10 people on screen, uh, including my fellows, because I, I, I didn't meet my fellows <laughs> in person until quite recently. So I interviewed them on, 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 on Zoom and, and um, I had all these lectures in different communities. And um, what I began to do about halfway was uh, to do a little show and tell in the beginning, which means that I kind of look at the background that you have on Zoom. For instance, right now in Amy's background, there are many books. And I will like pick one and I say, I ask you about uh, that particular book on the upper left-hand corner. Tell me about it. And, and it's amazing how much that breaks the wall, you know, the third wall or whatever, and, and you know, opens up. I, I realized that some of the students may, may have food insecurity issues because, you know, they're in a room and you, you, you kind, of, kind of can read the room. I'm very highly visual to begin with. So I can kind of sense, oh, what is, you know, her life about and, and what is the environment that, you know, she is living in at home, sequestered. You know, and 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 so that those are signals that was important to me to recognize and and even acknowledge in in some way. And when 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 we spend first 15 minutes just doing show and tell, uh, it seems that the Zoom, you know, because it's not like when you do a lecture, you can go into people's rooms. Uh, and but here was an opportunity to connect with people at a deeper level. And and I think even though my lecture may be shorter. You know, it was more productive. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, uh, Amy, uh, a story about uh, something that happened to you as a researcher or educator. Well, I guess I, the, I do remember one day, uh, and this is very similar to what Marco said, but one day where I, I, mean, I hadn't really thought much about it, but one day I gave a talk in Germany in the morning, in Boston at noon, and in, in China in the very late evening. and. I just started thinking about that as um, you know the 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 beauty of it as well as the the stress of it and because it's possible uh, does that make it good um, and <laughs> it's certainly exhausting there were three very different talks so it wasn't just a rinse and repeat um, moment um, and then you know there's a sense of connecting and, and and embracing hugging this whole great world um, and then there's also a sense of of loneliness at the same time so that's the hybrid um, emotional state I think I think we're slowly learning that living in a hybrid world means the capability to hold simultaneously extremes that are becoming even more extremes so even connected to what Makoto was saying about these streams of time Lisa a story or another another thought from your so one thing that i've learned about myself is my job is actually to make people brave and i've been using you know a lot of energy and passion and my body language doing that in physical rooms and i've learned about myself that i have been bringing more intensity uh, being like, you know when you sing with a strong voice but a little bit more intense to create that bravery I've shown more feelings. I've been crying more, <laughs> been showing anger more. I don't know what, why, but I think it's mm. the difficulty of not being just able to do the thing that I usually do <laughs> with my body has made me 
lower the bars for the others by revealing so much more about myself. So I've been so much more open, vulnerable, surprised <laughs> about that actually. Interesting. Maybe because the being remote, there is a you know, <laughs> there is a kind of little bit of protection in a way in doing that. So uh, I have one question which actually comes from the only, which is very very interesting, uh, and from Julian. It says. Uh, Part of psychological safety, so I suppose it's directly to, to Amy, uh, but we can all reflect about this. Part of psychological safety is to forget and to forgive. Yet mm. now with digitalization, digital tools record and analyze our every move. So what's happening in this case? <laughs> can we still feel psychologically safe in a world where everything is recorded? And that. <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, I'm, I'm afraid it's not really a question. I think it's a statement, um, and I think you're very likely right. It's a it's a it's a risk to manage um, the the risk and the understanding. I think that's going to take some real problem solving, maybe some creativity uh, as well, to think through the implications of the permanent record of everything that we do and say, and what implications that has for psychological safety. I think that's very very important. Fantastic. Uh, uh, I have an, another question that would ask to uh, to Lisa uh, about visualization. I mean, uh, in a way, uh, uh, moving digitally and able to collaborate more, much more verbally with the written uh, language. Uh, but what about the power of visualization and other kind of uh, or even prototypes around the question and prototype that uh, are much more difficult? Yes, but it's always been difficult. <laughs> so it's always been difficult to move into a new technique. Uh, so I think that we just need to, uh, you know, explore even th further. And I've seen, you know, so many fantastic examples of people starting to draw on a paper and put it up and see, hmm, that didn't work. So then you kind of bring up your PowerPoint and then you draw on that and see if that works. So I actually think that it's just kind of continuous exploring and showing new types of prototypes and not be limited but that our brain think that there is a screen in between. I don't think that, you know, that's just a camera and you can still prototype things and show that to the camera. Uh, so that is kind of what I, uh, you know, continue to do that play, <laughs> use Lego, whatever, to, to show your thoughts into a concrete prototype. Thanks. And uh, with this, we conclude our panel. We learned that hybridization basically makes things more extreme compresses and expand and and the only thing we can do is explore how to our posture in, in front of this extreme they are becoming even uh, more far from each other thank you very much and I hand it over to the final session thank you roberto and thank you to all panelists for those insights and reflections so I am here with you again, Magnus Maring. Hi again. Um, <laughs> and I thought we, before moving on to the closing conversation, mm -hmm. we would just take a moment to uh, perhaps resume and reflect a little bit on what we've heard during the day. Mm -hmm. It's been uh, massive, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I know that something that you have reflected on is the question of imbalances. Yeah, well, I guess that's one of the themes that's come up uh, during the afternoon and and uh, also really it goes back to Caroline uh, Berg's uh, initial comments about uh, inclusivity and uh, you know the importance to um as she put it the managing digital transformation in society in a way that that is inclusive and that brings people with the change rather than puts people against uh, uh, these, you know, massive, potentially massive transformative uh, shifts. Um, so, so inclusivity seems to be a, a, a really important word. Um, but related to that, of course, is the power of technology, and that is also something that came across both from Annabelle's uh, keynote and from the panel on AI, for example, is really, you know how on the one hand technology has this power to 
a change resource utilization so that it becomes entirely different. You know, she gave this examples of how platforms are the biggest firms in their industries without owning any of the traditional assets, right? Um, so there's this tremendous power of technology in creating things in a new way. And there's economies of scale in that, there are network effects, they become you know, natural monopolies, if you will, but that also, of course, risks creating imbalances. And I think that clearly was one of the themes in the, um, p in the panel discussion with, uh, with Annabelle and Yuna Samuelsson and, um, and Samuel uh, Englum. Um, but um, but it, it's probably something we see throughout, us tr throughout the uh, afternoon as well. And in a way, you know, you could say that that's the backside of the flip side of psychological safety is potentially exclusion instead of inclusion as well. I was thinking about this uh, power shift that has been mentioned as well from governments failing mm -hmm. and local organizations acting. Mm -hmm. So what does that do to, to uh, our societies? We've heard a bit about that as well. Yeah, uh, I, I think... Uh, that's another theme from this afternoon, I, I think, is, is um, sort of cro cross-sector collaboration and, and how we can manage that and, and what that can potentially bring. And I'm, I'm curiously sort of looking forward in a couple of minutes, we'll, uh, we'll have a, a few more people with us to pursue these topics. Um, but another thing that I thought was really interesting is, um, well, I mean, not surprisingly, but importantly, quite a lot of people have stressed the importance of managing technology proactively and, and influencing how technology is shaped before it shapes us. Uh, so that's been one theme. But, but one, another theme that really surprised me is um, uh, Makoto Fujimura's uh, stressing uh, generativity. Uh, because to me, generativity is a fundamental attribute of digital innovation. Uh, because what happens when you innovate with digital technologies is that you have this uh, amazing ability to recombine things in response to what the innovation triggers. And, and that sort of back and forth interaction between use and development is often uh, described as generative in a digital innovation context. But Makoto took this word, or used this word, to denote things that are fundamentally very human. And he talked about, you know, living a, a generative life and how, how um, uh, acting and being in a certain way creates new qualities potentially in your, in your life, as, as I understood it. I will be sure to re-watch uh, <laughs> his uh, keynote later. Uh, he also spoke about generational, right? So yes. uh, we've heard about from, from so many speakers today and yes. we've had such interesting keynote presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, one voice that is a little bit missing and that mm -hmm. will be affected by this is the voice of our students, mm -hmm. of our children. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, with this 500-year uh, perspective in mind, yeah. is there anything from today's discussion that you would advise us to take home and discuss at the dinner table with our children tonight, with our students uh, next week? That's a tall order. Uh, but I think one of, one of the things that I see time and again is that we overestimate our ability to predict the future with technology and that we oversimplify. So we tend to think very linearly about what will happen. And I think w what we, n I think we would do ourselves a favor if we would be more humble in our predictions, more curious and more accepting of uncertainty and perhaps creative in, in shaping different scenarios of what the future not will bring, but what w how we can shape the future. So I think, you know, th really understanding that we can't predict and starting from there in shaping ideas of what we would want to contribute to, that, that is... Seeing the futures we want to live in. Yes, and trying to make them happen, yeah. 
So we are moving into the closing conversation, and there is yeah. a number of, of really interesting guests. Some of them we have met before as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what will you? Uh, what would you like to explore with them? So I'm curious about um, a number of things. I'm, I'm curious about some of these themes that I just brought up, uh, but I'm also curious about sort of exploring further. Where do we go from here? You know, what should we do now, and what are, how how can we explore the exactly really these different scenarios? And uh, of course, since uh, several of my colleagues are here, I'm interested in where higher education goes from here, for example, but also where where organizations go from here, right? So uh, I think those are a couple of different um, themes, and maybe the third theme might be. Um, long-term perspective and uh, the social side of of organization and enterprise great. should we try that yes what do you think i think that sounds great okay so let's do that magnus the next panel is yours Please awesome. go ahead great